there are political and economic movements happening right now. And if you don't understand what's happening and why, you're gonna be the one that loses. And not just you, it's gonna be your family, your business, the teams that you've built, they're all gonna be the ones stuck holding back the flood when the dike breaks, okay? So let me understand, let me help you understand the context. Let's pull back the curtain and take a look. Because before we can get to the nitty gritty, I need you to understand the context, right? So basically what happens in any changing world order, this is what we're talking about, right? The changing world order uh, and how it impacts us today. So the changing world order, in any time it, it changes, right? There's a growing gap between the rich people and the poor people. There's a wealth gap. And the reason this happens is because, um, you know, there's gonna be normal debt cycles that happen every like 10, eight to 10 years, okay? Of prosperity, there's gonna be recession, uh, and the Fed's going to be manipulating the interest rate and they're going to be printing money and they're going to be trying to smooth how everyone experiences a recession, right? So every eight to 10 years, there's a pullback in the economy. It's normal. It's part of the cycle. Now, um, because of the government's intervention to try to smooth those cycles, this is what happens. One of their levers that they pull when they you know, restructure debt and whatnot is they change taxes around. So because there's a, a growing wealth gap, they'll tax the wealthy and redistribute that wealth to the poor. Um, now, let me explain the phenomenon that happens. S like a lot of the people who are in the top 5%, 10%, 1%, whatever, like the, the rich people, part of what put them there is they have a mindset of abundance, right? They have a habit of investing, of saving, of budgeting, of financial vitality and resilience. It's not just the fact that they have a, a butt ton of money, right? It's like there are habits, there's stuff about their personality that make them qualify them for wealth, right? And so they have these habits of investing. And so you, they buy up real estate and, and who, they buy up like apartment buildings, right? And who lives in those? Poor people do, right? A lot of poor people will rent from them. Uh, they buy up businesses and they invest in stocks or they privately invest in, in companies and who are the employees of those companies? You know, a lot of the lower echelon people are, are the poor people, right? The working class. And so um, if there's a tax on the rich people and they redistribute that to the poor people, then the poor people will take that money. And, and let me just, before I say that, let me just say, in contrast to the mindset of a wealthy person, the mindset of a poor person is they're more consumer centric. They don't have the same habits of saving, of investing, of strategic thinking, right? They, they live paycheck to paycheck and so they'll get their paycheck or they'll get their government stimulus and then they'll go consume it, right? They'll buy stuff, they'll buy food and gadgets and entertainment and different things like that. Now, wealthy people, as you know, we all know, like they, they do plenty of entertainment and they do plenty of gadget buying and all that kind of stuff. But what we might not realize is that only represents a fraction of their total income. And so while the, you know, whatever income they get, a fraction of it goes to, you know, luxuries and then a fraction of it goes to buying up more assets, right? They buy more stocks and more companies and on and on and on. So um, if, if the government taxes the rich and takes all this money and redistributes it through different programs to the poor, the poor will, because of their average mindset, they will go and consume stuff. They'll go buy another iPhone, right? And so that benefits Apple as a company. And so the Apple stock benefits a little bit from every single transaction, right? And who ultimately benefits from that? The shareholders of Apple, which are the wealthy people who have the mindset of investing in Apple. And so over time, through these normal you know, debt cycles and restructuring debt about every eight to 10 years and government intervention on that same cycle, that gap just continues to grow and grow because every time they you know, try to redistribute the wealth, it just it assimilates throughout the economy in a way that further grows this gap, right? You give it to the poor people, the poor people spend it on things that you know, benefit the businesses, that benefit the shareholders, and it benefits the rich people, right? So, and I'm not, I'm not arguing the morality of this activity, and I'm not saying it's unique to the United States because it's not. It's happened in every country, you know, that we can, ha you know, remember. <laughs> it's just that's how the economic machine works. So I'm not arguing the morality of that activity. 
I'm just a mechanic. I'm just attempting to approach this like a mechanic with a car and say, this is how it works. And if you can understand that, then you can predict um, the outcome of these events, right? And you can understand where you fit in that cycle and play your role well. Or if you're dissatisfied with your role, you can change your role, right? Based on the rules that you see. <laughs> so, um, you know, that being said, there's a growing economic wealth gap, socioeconomic gap. And the middle class gets vaporized, they get hampered, and so they disappear. This causes tension, understandably, right? The poor people have a sense that the rich people have somehow gamed the system. And I, it, again, I'm just trying to paint a template picture here, some averages, so I'm not diving specifically yet into the United States versus like other countries. And so maybe at times the, the wealth have cons like the wealthy class have conspired and truly gamed the system. But on average, it's really, I'm just trying to help you understand the natural incentives and really what drives the machine. So it's like there's this natural tension versus the haves and the have nots. And that tension continues to grow and grow to the point in which there starts to be you know, philosophical clashes, philosophical riots, people crying out against the wealthy, um, saying that, you know, calling them privileged, calling them, you know, whatever, they have a whole host of things that you call them. And then sometimes those philosophical battles turn to physical battles, so actual physical riots where, and, uh, you know, talking specifically of the United States, uh, although it has happened in every country that has gone through a changing world order, um, talking specifically of the United States, in the last year we've seen these riots where, you know, they've smashed businesses and smashed vehicles and destroyed properties and things like that um, in an effort to release their frustration because, you know, in their mind, that's the way to get back at the man, right? That's the way to get back at the wealthy class. And so um, that happens. And in some cases throughout history, not necessarily in the United States, but other countries, it doesn't stop at physical assets, right? There's, you know, you think of, like overthrowing France, right? The French Revolution, and, and there's like actually bloody battles where like the aristocrats get targeted and killed. And so, um, and regardless to like where you're at in history, whenever this starts happening in that country, the wealthy class, they see the writing on the wall. And so they say, well, at very best and benign, my wealth is at stake because there's going to be a, a big redistribution of wealth because that's what the federal government will do to respond to the increasing pressure that they feel. And so the wealthy will say, well, my wealth is at stake and, and perhaps my life, my well-being, like I, I might not be safe here anymore. And so there starts to be a movement of, of you know, the wealthy class to take their assets their wealth and sometimes themselves and take it out of the economy, remove it from that economy and put it into another economy that they think or feel is safer or more stable or just a better investment, right? And so uh, whenever it hits a critical, like this obviously hurts the economy because every wealthy person that just grabs their assets and parks them somewhere else outside the US, well, now that wealth is, is gone, right? It's not creating jobs in the US. It's not it's not buying goods in the US that benefit people, right? And so we lose that, right? It's the whole Atlas Shrugged thing of, you know, who is John Galt and all the rich people kind of go and form their own world, right? <laughs> and so um, it hurts the existing economy. And so like this, it just accelerates the sinking boat type of feel. And so it becomes alarming, the government realizes that this movement is happening in a trend and so they will do things to stop the movement. And so they will, you know, in the case of people leaving the country in order to seek a better environment, they will stop you from doing that, for one. Or they can, you know, stop you from moving your capital outside of the country. And if you don't believe me, just look, like, so we're here in Mexico right now. And uh, we're, we're here on this, you know, I'm reporting for Mexico on this discovery uh, of understanding more about how different countries interact with each other, how the different cultures work, and what's the perception here versus in the United States and versus other countries in an effort to pull back the curtain and understand truth versus error. Okay, so here I am. Uh, this is an important document for us while we're traveling. This is a passport, okay? So 
my password and every password on page number five says, this is US government property. This passport is the property of the United States. It, it must be surrendered upon demand made by an authorized representative of the United States government. So in theory, like if it, the US saw a movement of people leaving the country and they did not like that because it was hurting the economy, they, they can rescind this document and just by issuing a declaration, I would have to come back to the United States. So um, that, that's a real thing. Now, how does this work on capital markets? Let's say like, okay, well, what about the rich people who don't want to leave the United States, but they're concerned for their wealth, uh, and so th they want to transfer that and invest in other economies? Well, okay, so let me, let me just explain that there are real movements happening right now to stop you from doing that, okay? So l let's say, okay, well, we've been talking about China as uh, the rising power. Okay, and they're the big contender versus the United States. And you, you might be thinking, well, how do I invest in China? If China has some stability there um, and U.S. has some volatility and we want to take some of our wealth and, and put it into the Chinese economy, how do we do that? Well, probably the most simplest way to do that uh, as an American citizen is to buy stocks, invest in stocks in Chinese companies, so companies based in China but that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, so um, right now in the United States, there's about you know, 240 companies that are based in China. They're Chinese companies, but they are registered, you know, both, they're publicly companies, publicly traded companies. They're, they're registered on the Chinese Stock Exchange, but they're also registered on the New York Stock Exchange. And so it's this, it makes it possible to, for Americans to invest in them through the New York Stock Exchange. And some of the biggest companies are like, Alibaba okay, is, the, is the biggest publicly traded company that's Chinese. If you know anyone who's involved in fulfillment by Amazon, FBA, like you know Alibaba because what it is is it's, it's a spot for manufacturers to gather. Um, and it's how like manufacturers you know, contract with people to manufacture stuff. So in the old days, if you wanted to import stuff, you know, you wanted to like make some kind of product or trinket and you wanted to access like a Chinese manufacturing plant, you'd have to like fly to China or call them. There's a lengthy process. You'd have to like show them your test sample thing and be like, hey, can you retool your factory to make these? And you do that enough times and you kind of figure out who's gonna make your stuff and import it into the United States. Well, nowadays it's made pretty simple through Alibaba. It's just like you can hop on the website, you can find um, you know, manufacturers of lots of different stuff and you can contract with them. In fact, a lot of the stuff that's sold on Amazon, and frankly, Amazon's not the only one, but they're just the most popular, right? But you know, Walmart, Target, um, all these other on, like stick-built retailers that have online shops, they have a very similar model, uh, like FBA. <laughs> and so, a lot of products that are manufactured in China, and there's just like there's you know individuals like you or me who say like, well, I want to get in on this game, so I'm going to be a a distributor and so I'm gonna go like let's say in fact the supplements that we buy you know it's just some Chinese manufacturer that makes supplements and they're like hey does anyone in America want supplements and then someone in America was like yeah I'm gonna buy like you know 5,000 units and I'm gonna distribute them here in the US and so they found that through Alibaba and they sell it on Amazon and that's you know, the supplement that we buy and it's a good product I'm just explaining how this works <laughs> okay so that's Alibaba they're they're the top publicly traded Chinese company that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Followed in second place by Pinduoduo, which is a marketplace that connects farmers in China to consumers in China. It's like farm to market. Uh, you can like buy organic produce. All right, and then um, followed third place by JD.com. So JD.com, you can think of it kind of like, um, well, it's kind of, it's Amazon. It's the Chinese version of Amazon. Uh, like the exact same thing. Just think Amazon in China. And then there's the fourth largest company is called Baidu. And Baidu is the Google of China. So it's just the same thing. It's a search engine, but really what drives their revenue is like the massive data that they gather and the artificial intelligence and machine learning and advertising and targeted placements of stuff. Like that's their model. Same as Google, okay? And so those four companies are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. By the way, none of those companies benefit America. They operate solely in China. They're Chinese companies, right? Like we 
don't access their services. Well, except for Alibaba, right? Like I can hop on Alibaba.com and like find a Chinese company to contract with. But uh, outside of that, like all the others, um, like I don't use Baidu to for my search engine. I use Google, okay? And JDCom, like I can't use JDCom here. I use Amazon <laughs> uh, or in the United States, I mean. So that being said, um, like the, those, the, there are lots of I know, thought leaders in the investment space that have seen the financial health of those companies and invested, right? And they've noticed the volatility of U.S. securities, and they've said, "I want to move some of my wealth into the Chinese market." And so they, through the New York New York Stock Exchange, have bought securities uh, in those companies. Okay, and so I'm not advocating like, "Hey, transfer all your money to Chinese markets," right? Because uh, I don't think anyone is really saying that. Uh, even the good thought leaders have a mix in their portfolio. They have a mix of you know, US securities and a mix of foreign securities, stocks and bonds. They have a mix of um, you know, real estate and gold and stuff. And so like none of the investment, like any investment advice worth its salt, nobody's gonna say put all your eggs in this one basket. So that's not what is being said here. I'm just explaining how the system works and, and the incentives behind these movements, okay? So the thought leaders have invested, you know, millions and in, in billions of dollars in the Chinese market and uh, through the New York Stock Exchange. And as that movement has continued to happen, it has become increasingly concerning to the United States government who would rather th those dollars be invested in the U.S. Now, I, I'm not saying that that's, you know, a good idea because um, you know, that's not really for this conversation to decide. It's just you know, the wealthy people seeing that their dollars here are at risk to be taxed and redistributed want to move that money to a Chinese market, and so they have made those investments. Um, and, and so the, the U.S. said, well, we need, uh, like it's concerning to them. And so in an effort to curtail that, make it harder or in some ways impossible to continue to invest in the Chinese market, they passed a law. So Donald Trump, before leaving office, signed into law the um, Hold Foreign Companies Accountable Act. It was signed into law in December of 2020, right? But the security, and what the law basically said was that any company that was based um, in a foreign country needs to be able to have all of its records audited by a like U.S. auditing firm like Deloitte or something like that and make those public and then the U.S. government gets to review all those audits um, and if you're unable to comply with that or unwilling to we will delist you from the New York Stock Exchange and so um, there's many companies like that's a pretty in, in many ways it's an undesirable thing for those co companies operating in those countries to do. And so there's a lot of companies that will you know, not be able to or reject to do it. And so therefore will be delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. And so um, this, this is directly an effort for the U.S. to say, hey, we don't want American citizens to be able to invest in you through the stock exchange. They do it under the guise of saying, hey, we just want greater transparency, but really it's a pretty onerous thing for them and it's really not in their, like it doesn't benefit them to you know, be able to provide that level of detail. So um, the response will be a lot of Chinese companies will be delisted from the stock exchange, making it very hard for you and me to transfer wealth into that economy, okay? So um, it was the end of March that the SEC finally passed you know, they started implementing it, right? And it, there's a 90 day window there. So if you look at the performance of all those companies that I mentioned, plus others, starting in April, the value of those stocks really started to drop and plummet. And that's the reason, is because the United States has implemented, you know, controls over how US dollars can move into the Chinese market. And, uh, and so that's, that's interesting, right, that this is happening. What has happened before in other changing world orders of stopping wealth from being transferred um, is, is interesting to, to see and it's concerning, okay? So that brings me to this 
um, the, the question is, well, what do we do about it? <laughs> and that's what I'm super excited with. I want to share it with you. Uh, I'm really jazzed. I have a huge announcement that's mind blowing, but I'm going to talk about it in one of the videos that are coming up. And so I'm going to save it for that. Make sure that you subscribe and set your alerts. Okay. It's coming, but it's going to help you. I mean, it's going to answer this question, right? What to do about it. And again, um, some people say, Hey, you know, you, you sound like you're trying to generate fear in a lot of people. Uh, and that's really not the case at all. I'm just explaining how the economic machine works. The, the motives behind the movements and so that you can start planning and you can realize this is happening. It very well is happening. It's a fact. And so if I understand what has been done in the past, I can understand and you can understand what to do about it so that your finances, your business's finances are positioned in a way that protects you and your family and your teams. Okay. That's the goal here. I'm super stoked. Remember, subscribe and then set the alerts because we're going to talk about this and uh, I'll see you there.